Welcome back to Variant Cron. I'm Dr. Daniel Brubaker. Over the past uh, year or so, and especially over the past several months, I have received a lot of response to my work, to my book, to these videos, and that is actually very flattering. It clearly talks about the um, uh, perceived importance and the perceived significance of what I've been doing. Now, today I am just going to spend a few minutes. There's so much material out there and there have been so many uh, comments and discussions, <clears throat> but among those there are some questions and uh, challenges and accusations and assertions that seem to be resurfacing regularly, and so I just want to address a few of those. I, I will be spending some more time uh, in coming days, weeks, months, uh, answering your questions from the comments in the videos that you have been leaving, but today I just want to answer a couple of them that uh, seem to pop up quite a bit. So one thing I will say about the many of the responses that I have seen so far is that they tend to be coming from people who are, um, uh, you know, the most, the most critical responses have been coming from people who are coming from a um, Muslim background who have uh, an apologetic view or a polemical view of uh, these things and are really trying to defend a position that they hold clearly, uh, personally hold, and uh, feel to be important. And I don't fault anybody for taking that sort of uh, position or for working to defend what they believe. I think that's uh, an honorable pursuit uh, if it's done in an honest way. What I have observed about these things is that uh, they frequently come also from a non-academic, non-scholarly background. And that also I don't fault uh, anybody for because not everybody has the opportunity to take advanced studies in every particular subject or topic. And just because you have not done advanced studies in that topic does not mean that you are forbidden or off limits from talking about those things or thinking about them or discussing them. So it's okay to discuss things among people who uh, don't have uh, a solid academic background. And that having been said, uh, there are clues in almost every written uh, document that I have seen and in every uh, video response or other discussion that there are shortcomings academically and from a scholarly perspective. Among these are the, uh, for example, the incorrect use of the uh, in incorrect transcription, including of the word Quran itself. And uh, in Arabic, uh, there are two letters that get represented carelessly by a, an apostrophe uh, when transcribing, which is not really correct. And those letters are Ayn and Hamza. The correct way of writing the word Quran, which is not written with an Ayn, is with the, um, uh, with the left word facing half circle macron and uh, because the forward facing or rightward facing half circle macron represents the letter ein which does not exist in the word quran so that would be incorrect if the forward facing macron is used or if a forward facing apostrophe is used now the apostrophe is sort of a careless way of writing it because it's not always easy to insert the macron when you are writing uh, or typing. But I just want to point that out, that when you do see the word Quran written uh, that way, that it is a mark that somebody does not have a very strong background in Arabic uh, or and or in Arabic transcription. That's uh, number one. Um, there are two generally correct accepted ways of writing Quran. If you write it with the uh, macron, you should also write it with the uh, other macron over the A to show the long uh, the long aleph with the mada over it that occurs in the word Quran, or you can write it without them all together, Q-U-R-A-N. So both of those are correct ways to write Quran and uh, in, in English. So that is, that's number one, just a clue if you want to look at something and, and judge the, uh, the quality of it. The next thing that I'll mention is the uh, question that seems to come up again and again lately, the assertion that there are earlier manuscripts that contain the Uthmanic uh, Rasam, so to speak, uh, what is uh, called the Uthmanic Rasam, than the ones that I'm showing corrections in. And this typically is presented as as a with you know as a suggestion that 
therefore there's nothing to be concerned about here, there's nothing to see here because uh, there's an earlier manuscript that has it the quote-unquote right way. Well, I have never uh, presented these things with an assertion that uh, there is no earlier manuscript with the so-called correct reading or the, or the standard reading. Now, obviously, that is something worth considering and looking at over time to see when these corrections or variations, if there are variants, when do they occur, do they recur in multiple manuscripts, and, uh, and so forth. But this is intended to suggest that these things that I have found are mere scribal errors or mistakes. Now, it is possible that a number of these things are mere scribal mistakes. Even some of the ones that may not initially look like they are scribal mistakes. I have never denied that. I have given you my judgment about these things and my assessment of them. And, you know, that's okay. And if somebody else wants to come and challenge that, that's fine. And the emergence of further data and information could also challenge or modify our view of these things. This is how the pursuit of knowledge works. This is how uh, academics who are honest work with their material and so forth. And so we don't hold on to things with a with an iron grip and refuse to let go of them. We, we just look at them and think about them and, you know, get uh, into discussions with other people who have uh, maybe looked at them from a different angle or who have more information or different information than we do. That's how it works. But I think that there's been a misunderstanding of my assertions. Now, I did not make one of the one of the uh, humorous things to me about uh, the earlier review, which, uh, by the way, Haitham Sidki wrote a review of my uh, book, which appeared in an academic journal about a year ago now. And uh, that response to that review is coming. I, I wasn't quite sure whether to respond to it at first, but I, I have now written a response to it, and you will be able to see that very soon. A couple of comments about that. I, obviously, there's a lot of detail in it that I will deal with, but uh, first thing to observe about that is that uh, Sidki does not even correctly quote the title of my book in the title of his, uh, of his review. It did appear in an academic journal. I don't know why uh, nobody uh, caught that, Haitham, or the people who reviewed it, but uh, these are, and that's the first of many, uh, many mistakes and problems in that review, but I'll, I'll be talking about those more later. But the uh, thing that Haitham says and that others have said is, uh, well, that they haven't said, but they've uh, asserted that there is a thesis to my book or to my work. And it surprised me when I saw that assertion because I didn't recall having stated a thesis. But Haitham and uh, others have seemed to proceed on the assumption that I have said, which I have not, that there was a long, long period of standardization, that the Quran was not standardized early. Now, I have never said that the Quran is not standardized early. I have held that uh, as an open question, and uh, and as an open question, I've allowed the possibility that it was standardized early. There are indications that would seem consistent with something like an early standardizing event. My work has been focused on how widespread and accepted the text was throughout the time in the centuries following the initial delivery of the Quran. So if let's assume for the sake of argument there was an early standardization, this would not mean that necessarily there was not continued disagreement or uh, slightly variant perceptions about what was the correct text of the Quran at some later date and in certain areas. And so my own, I won't say thesis because I haven't really presented a, a thesis yet, but my own uh, assertion on this subject has been much more subtle, really, that there appears to be a certain de degree of variance a certain small degree of variance in the perception of what is the correct text of the Quran at certain points in the Quran and at certain times and places of the production of these manuscripts. So that's really important to clarify. Okay, let's see. So just dealing with a couple of other things. 
There is uh, another recurring theme of defining the Quran as only those things which match what is considered to be the uh, so-called Uthman Akrasim. And so this is kind of a convenient trick, I would say. It's not, well, it's, it's, it's interesting because you can say, well, that manuscript fragment is not a, is not, you can't call it a Quran because it doesn't match the standard Quran. It's something different. It's, it looks like Quran, it's Quranic, it's a similar type of Quranic type of material, but it's not really the Quran because it doesn't match the Uthmanic text type. And I, I get it. I understand the uh, line of thinking, but it does not seem to be very academic or scholarly to me because it's just too easy. You can define <clears throat> you can define something by uh, as aligning to a presumed standard that is really related to you in the secondary literatures. But in order to do so, you've therefore assumed that those secondary literatures are correct in what they relate. And in this case, these secondary literatures were written a hundred and fifty years or so at first after the events that they describe. So one of the questions about this work is whether those secondary literatures actually tell us the full and true story of what happened earlier. So to take them as the authority from the start and the way, the lens through which you view these early manuscripts is not a scholarly approach to the material. So, you could say it's not the Quran as we have it today, but to say that it is not Quranic material if it does not match the documented um, uh, things that we have about the text itself is uh, really kind of uh, disingenuous. It's a it's a more of a rhetorical trick than uh, than a, than a real scholarly approach to the material. Another question that has naturally arisen has been whether the scribe that I have maybe judged to be a different scribe was in fact a different scribe or whether it was the original scribe. Obviously, this is a an art, not a science, the interpretation of these manuscripts, and I have visited most of these manuscripts um, in person and have held them in my hands and, and looked at them. And so when I look at what the scribe has done and judge whether it's the original scribe or not, I'm not looking only at one of these factors. I'm looking at all these factors together. I may only cite one or two of the factors, nib width or angle of the text or color of the ink or whatever, but there are actually other things. When you look at somebody's uh, handwriting and compare it to another piece of handwriting, you can tell based upon a number of factors whether it is that person's handwriting. And you may cite a couple things about it, you know, the, the, the loop of the, you know, the, uh, the hangs down below the line is, you know, really big or shaped a certain way or whatever, but there are other things about that. There are features of it that just you just know you can look at it and you're looking at a very complex analysis. Your brain is doing a complex analysis of what's on the page. And so when I look at script uh, and make these judgments, I'm looking at the overall picture and usually I think I'm correct or on the right track. Um, so I yeah, don't think that's something that needs to be really necessarily argued about, but I'm not also defensive of uh, somebody else stating another opinion about it. All right, so I think I'm going to leave it there today. This has been kind of a, maybe a little bit of a brainy video uh, for all of you, so thank you for bearing in and uh, and for watching these things and caring about them. We will talk more uh, in coming days. Until then, take care. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. <music>